the big bark. Listen up, dog owners. It's for you, all you canine lovers. It's your favorite podcast, The Big Bark, with your host, Dara Burke, and canine co host, Bruno and Millie. The Big Bark. Hello, my name is Sarah Burke, and welcome to another episode of The Big Bark, the show that is barking mad about your dog, where we discuss the hottest topics from the canine world, meet with canine professionals, and chat to dog owners about the bonds that make a dog man's best friend. Joining me, as always, somewhere floating around there, I don't really know where, uh, there is a chicken cooking in the kitchen, so they might be gone for that, but uh, my good old pals, Bruno and Millie. And we're joined today virtually by Karen Kennedy from Limmer Canine Physio, who will be our co-host for today, as we chat about all things canine physiotherapy. So later on, we'll be putting some questions to Karen that were sent in to us by dog owners over the last week, so stick around for that. And a bit later on after that, we'll be meeting with Kieran Sheehan from Muttmouth, Ireland. So Kieran will be telling us all about his product, and we'll be having a look at that first of all let me welcome karen there to the show karen very welcome hi hi dara how are you not too bad in yourself i'm not too bad now i'm excited to be involved it's great good good glad to have you here and karen so start off and like we'll give you the spotlight for a few minutes tell us exactly what it is that you do um so i am a veterinary physiotherapist but i suppose i'm also a fully qualified veterinary nurse so that's what i started off doing first of all i qualified from ucd in 2006 um and then i worked for a few years in treaty veterinary clinic in thomagate as a veterinary nurse so um in 2009 then i went to australia and i worked for a year in a referral hospital over there in sydney and it was there that I saw the benefits of veterinary physiotherapy. So I realized how lacking it was in Ireland, um, which was a shock at the time. So I was determined then when I would get home that I would become qualified in the area and start working in it. So um, in 2010, then I went to the UK to Harper Adams University. And that's where I studied veterinary physiotherapy. Uh, I had to do it through well, I went part time. So I went over and back to the UK while I worked as a veterinary nurse at the time. Um, and became qualified after two years. Um, so since then, I've just been working. I did a combination of nursing and physio. Um, but over the years now, it's just kind of narrowed it down to just physio. So I've worked between Cork and Galway and Limerick um, doing small animal physiotherapy. So it's just dogs and cats mainly that I treat. Um, so it's great, really. Um, it's becoming more popular now. It was very lacking, I think, at the start. But this year in particular is the busiest year that I've had treating small animals. So it's really, really great to see that. Okay, that's great. And it, it, it must be a very interesting career. Like I said, there's, there's not many people really doing it in Ireland. No, yeah, it is. It's great. It's really interesting and it's really rewarding as well. Um, it's definitely very different to veterinary nursing, whereas I kind of thought it would be it would be similar. And I do use my nursing skills all the time, I suppose, in physiotherapy, but it's a very, very different approach. It's really calm and relaxing. And um, it took me a while to get used to that, actually. I was always rushing. And then I realized I had loads of time, so I didn't know why I was rushing. Um, but it's very, very rewarding. We build up a trust with the patients, which is nice. You don't really have enough time to do that in the nursing world. So um, I usually spend about an hour with my patients and by the end of it, I, I use a lot of treats, um, bribes, and they they really love that. So they, you know, once they're used to me, they're coming running in the door to me, which is lovely to see that in the vets as well, because most dogs hate coming into the vets. So when you see them coming running in the door to me, it's really, really nice. It's very rewarding. Yeah, what you said there about most dogs hate the vets. My own two dogs, actually, Bruno Millie, go to out the tree here, out to John outside. Oh, and we, we actually had, uh, I think it was, was it Aoife, I think, last year, that we had on, I believe, on the show. It could have been oh, Aoife, yes, I think. Yeah. And uh, we had a live session from uh, Tree there uh, sometime there last year. Like, And that was great fun. And like that was actually our first live show. But Bruno, like the minute he walks into the vet, it's kind of like, uh, like where am I? What's, what's going on here? And he quickly <laughs> realizes, like, no, I want to go. Whereas <laughs> Millie actually spent, I think it was a two to three weeks or two and a half weeks out uh, with John there last year like she stayed in because she had um what was it uh she had to have her womb removed for pyometria okay. and like every time millie goes back to her now she just she loves going into the door she thinks she's part of the <laughs> exactly yeah so Karen, what would be the most typical injuries that um that you would actually treat 
Um, yeah, I suppose um, I do see a lot of injuries, but the majority of what I see would be kind of like degenerative or chronic conditions. So we were talking about the likes of osteoarthritis and cranial cruciate ligament disease or um, intervertebral disc disease, that kind of a thing. Um, uh, they would be the majority of what I see. Um, injuries, I suppose, would be common enough as well. So like dogs who get hit by a car might have pelvic fractures or might have broken a leg and have had surgery for that. And they would need a lot of rehabilitation after their surgery. So that would be common enough. And then you would see um, muscle strains and ligament tears and that kind of thing as well. So um, it is very varied. But my I suppose my most common patient that I would treat is going to be your kind of typical a stiffer getting older type dog you know starting to slow down and struggle with with certain movements um that would be associated with osteoarthritis usually so that would be that and, and crucial ligament disease they'd be my most common kind of cases that i would see every week and you work on a referral based system is that correct yeah so i only work strictly through veterinary referrals so your vet will have to refer you on for um treatment with me so i think it's really important that um a physiotherapist generally should work alongside a veterinary surgeon really and it should be you know a team effort really so I always kind of keep um in touch with the referring vet and determine the best treatment and the best course going forward with them so um it's it's very important to me that the the patient is referred through their vet. Brilliant and like where exactly like uh where did you actually you said you uh learned about this in Australia mm-hmm. but what kind of gave you the like? I suppose the jump from uh, nurse from vet nursing to physiotherapy. I think it was always kind of in the back of my mind. So I do remember back in in UCD when I was studying um, nursing. Um, there was I remember we did one lecture in in the whole three years that I studied on veterinary physiotherapy, and I remember thinking at the time, this is so important in the human world. So why is it not as important for animals? Um, and that always stuck with me. So I always kind of, you know, looked into it. But back in the early days at the time, you had to be a chartered human physio to go on and study veterinary physio. Um, so that always kind of made me go, oh, well, I suppose that's not an option then. Um, and I remember at the time thinking, well, this should be something that nurses should be better trained in. You know, it should it should be a huge part of their training. Um, but then around the time that I went to Australia and I started to see, you know, qualified physios in action that's when I think some of the courses um, came into play where they were aimed at veterinary professionals instead. So vets and veterinary nurses and a lot of people in the equine industry, they were all um, targeted, you know, so that they could study veterinary physiotherapy and become qualified in the area. So then that was game changing for me, obviously. So that's really what did it It was that a course became available that I could do. Um, So I I jumped at that opportunity. And is there many, is there many people in all now actually doing it? it, Like I know I saw on Instagram there, a friend of yours, uh, I think some another physio actually shared the posts as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it, it doesn't seem to be common though. It's it's still not that common, but there's more and more of us every year, I suppose, becoming qualified. So yeah. um you know, I suppose that that person that shared it, that's um, Deirdre Duggan. So she's from Pet Paws Physio um, down in Cork. And I worked with Dee in Galabi Veterinary Hospital. Um, she taught me everything I knew about hydrotherapy down in the pool in Galabi. So um, she's amazing. And back when I was working with Dee back then, there was only a few of us. And I remember when I started going down to Cork, she was so excited that there was somebody else, you know, in the area that she could just talk to about it, you know, because it's really hard to work on your own. Um, you know when vets first qualify they have each other um, seeing what nurses so it is really really hard in the beginning Um, but I definitely I've seen a lot of interest in people doing courses definitely over the last few years and then more and more people becoming qualified so it is becoming more available for sure definitely. And you mentioned uh, hydrotherapy like that's something that I'm seeing myself that's become really really big in Ireland in the last few years. Yeah, it is. It's fantastic. You get really, really good results with hydrotherapy. Um, there's no facility in Limerick uh, currently that I know of anyway. Um, there's a few very good facilities in Cork and I think there's um, somewhere in Kildare as well. Um, but you need to be careful with hydrotherapy that you're going, you're still having what we like to call it is water-based physiotherapy. So um, you make sure that you're getting, you know, hyd- a hydrotherapist that's really well qualified in the area because it needs to be done correctly for it to be beneficial. Um, so that's one of the most important things. But I suppose there's an opportunity there for somebody. It's not going to be me um, to set up hydrotherapy in Limerick. Maybe if I won the lotto, I would do it. Um, <laughs> so we'll, maybe we'll see. Um, but it would be amazing to have it in Limerick. Like the results are just phenomenal with the pool. Um, but it is important that it's done correctly. It can, you know, things can go wrong as well. Yeah, and like I think myself, like even my own dogs, they they love water. 
So would you ever like would you ever see for instances where dogs are nervous going into like mm -hmm. the hydrotherapy yeah. tank or Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, they're all nervous going in because it's not like you know when you take your dog swimming, you're generally kind of um, going down to a river or going to the beach, and they're running around and they're having a great laugh. But for hydrotherapy, all of a sudden they're brought into a very strange atmosphere. Um, with you know the pools aren't very big for hydrotherapy; they don't need to be very big. So they see them and they're like, "That's just a big bath." And most dogs don't like being washed. Um, and you know it takes a lot of of building up their trust to get them into the water because it has to be. A real positive experience for them there's no point point in forcing them into it they have to willingly get in and you know realize this is really good and i feel really good after this um and then they want to get in quicker the next time so but initially it definitely it's it's not as positive as you would think for their first session um it takes up a while and every dog is different you know some of them do run in but um every, it's, some people will say oh my dog loves swimming you know and they're the ones that'll be most nervous of it and then other yeah. people will say oh my dog hates swimming and then you know after a few sessions they just adore it so um every dog will love it in the end but it does take a little while to get them used to it for sure so uh, we're talking here with uh karen kennedy from limit and prince we're live on facebook and youtube and on the big bar karen tell us what a typical day would involve for you um so um i'm just working in limerick at the moment so i did give up um going to galway and cork in the end so i had two babies so two babies at home so um i stick i'm sticking to limerick at the moment um but it is quite busy at the moment so your average consult is going to be um, you know, I'll do an, an assessment, first of all, assess their muscle mass and their muscle tone and watch how they move and, and you know, pick up on any abnormalities or um, bad habits that they can get into. You know, um, a lot of dogs can cheat really, really easily and their owners might not notice that. And um, when we're watching them moving, we're looking for these subtle little changes that have happened over time. Um, and that will only lead to further muscle loss and, and you know, um, bad habits going forward. So we pick up on all of these things quite early. Um, and then I will treat all of these things and I'll do some um, movement movement therapies and correct you know the ways that they're moving and doing transitions and a lot of dogs will sit badly sort of poor posture when they're sitting so we'll work on that a lot um and you also have kind of um therapeutic handling techniques like massage and um stretching just gentle kind of movements like that and i use electrotherapies as well in my consult so they would be aimed at um you know, providing pain relief most importantly and encouraging healing um getting blood flowing circulation flowing um and they also relax them quite a lot so it, they they really enjoy that part of of the consult um and then the most important part i suppose is that they get a prescribed home exercise program that they go home with so i call it homework um where they have to work on something every day and then I'll, every time I see them, I'll check on these exercises to make sure that they're improving on them. And the, the aim of those, I suppose, is to help to keep your dog mobile um, and to strengthen any weakened muscles, um, correct any bad movement um, and just improve their overall quality of life, really. That's brilliant. Like, that sounds like it sounds like a lot that you do. I, I like I suppose if you think of a human physiotherapist as well, like there is a lot that is involved that people won't know about. But like there's yeah. definitely a lot that are involved that, like with animal physiotherapy that I never realized myself yeah it is it's, it's really interesting actually but I suppose the the beauty of it is that my consults are about 45 minutes to an hour long so that's why there's so much in, involved in it you know whereas the vet consults are typically like 15 20 minutes so they're always rushing but I'm always just you know taking my time and making sure the dog loves me and then <laughs> going from there so it's really nice to have the time really to to build up a trust with them and then if they're relaxed if they're on board with you that's when you get the best results so if it's a positive experience for them they get more out of it and they work harder so you, you get better long-term term results with it then that's brilliant and karen how has like i suppose the two lockdowns and COVID and all that we've had to see how has it affected consultations um, initially, I was actually for our first lockdown back in March, I was still on maternity leave. So I was just due to come back from maternity leave. And I was like, Oh, God, what's happening now? Um, so that was a bit stressful at the time. Um, but once that lockdown was lifted, that's when I came back. And I was actually blown away with how busy things were. Um, because I just thought that, you know, nobody would be doing anything. But I suppose all of a sudden, everybody has time to spend with their dogs now. And a lot of people got new dogs as well. And it's a whole other topic. Um, but like all aspects of veterinary just seem to be really, really busy since March. Um, for the second lockdown, I suppose we kind of learned from the first one. So um, mm. even though I wasn't really working for the first one, but I realized that, you know, you have to be able to say what's essential and what's not essential. And we agreed that, you know, physiotherapy is definitely an essential treatment for them. There's a lot of pain relief involved in it and um, it's really, really important. So I decided that I will go forward 
um, with treating them. And I suppose I just give my clients the option of leaving their dog with me if they're not comfortable staying in the consult room. The downside of my treatment is that it's it's a long period of time, so it's not a short consult. So um, mm. I'll try and minimize the time in the actual consult room if I can. Um, the other kind of problem with it is that most dogs are more relaxed for physio when their owner is with them. The odd dog is better without their owner, but that's rare enough. Um, so um, most most owners will want to stay with their dog. So it is quite difficult, but we're working around it and we're finding ways to, to make it better and to make the risks um, fewer. So it's it's a challenging time for sure. Brilliant. And Karen, we'll, get, we'll be moving on to the Q&A there, but we have a uh, question after coming in on Facebook there. And this comes in from, let me see, hold on, here's one here. Uh, what is the most important thing to look out for with older dogs? Shane, thanks uh, for your question there. Um, with older dogs, I suppose what you want to keep an eye on is their everyday movement, so their functional movement. Anything that they start to struggle with is a sign of deterioration or a sign of, you know, joint disease or anything like that going on. So um, if you have like a, a normal, healthy dog and he's active and happy to exercise and everything like that, then I would just start getting into the habit of watching him move when he's on a walk Um watching the basic things like toileting that he's able to squat to go to the toilet with no problems or um you know all those little things that you don't look at on, on a normal day start keeping note of those um you want to look out for weight gain as well so um as they get older they tend to put on weight and excess weight is going to go against them when it comes to joints so it's really really important that you weigh them regularly because obviously you know when you're looking at them every day you don't see it creep up um so you need to get them on scales really regularly make sure that that weight isn't um, creeping up. And also as they start to do less, less exercise as they get older, reduce the amount of food that they're having because they don't need that much energy then. So um, that is a really, really important thing. And a common thing that I see in older dogs is obesity and excessive weight gain. Um, I suppose you want to also kind of get some joint supplements um, on board. As they get older, I kind of recommend it regardless whether they have joint disease or not. Most older dogs will have some kind of joint disease anyway. So definitely start getting the joint supplements into them at an early enough stage, really. Um, and just, you know, keep note of what they're happy to do and what they're not happy to do because they, the dog will tell you a lot themselves if you just watch them and if you listen to them. And, and just on what you said there, an echo there, I don't know what's on. Uh, just what you said does uh, with the supplements what supplements would you actually recommend um, there's so many different types of, of supplements out there at the moment so it's a real minefield but um, if you were to look at the clinical evidence regarding all of these supplements the ones that show the best results are omega-3 fatty acids so those are available if you look at all of these pres- joint disease prescription diets they'll have a high percentage of those in the food so that's a great way to get those into them because apparently if you want to be able to give them a high enough dosage of this, they won't tolerate it in a supplement form. It's too hard in the stomach. So it has to be included in their actual food for them to be able to get a high enough dose of it to be effective. So I would make sure that that's in their food first and foremost. Um, the, the glucosamine and um, all those kind of joint supplements, chondritin and all those that have been around for years, apparently the clinical evidence behind those is quite minimal, actually. Um Unless they're given for a very long time, you will see some results with them, but they are really easily digested and tolerated. So it's no harm for them to be getting them, you know, Um, but just make sure that you're getting the omega-3 fatty acids on board as well. Another really popular one at the moment is the green lipid muscle as well. So that's got um, the omega-3 fatty acids in that too. So and that's in a lot of the new joint supplements, I think. So that's something that I would recommend. But I'm not an expert in this area at all. It's definitely something to discuss with your vet too. Um but those that's what I give my dogs, I suppose I'll put it that way. They're on um the Hills J D prescription diet. So that's high in the omega three fatty acids. Um and they get a supplement as well that has the green lipid muscle in it too. Fantastic. And um, we have another question in here from uh Lydia. Lydia says any tips on dog hip dysplasia? Yeah, um, I suppose most dogs will be diagnosed with hip dysplasia when they're quite young. So you'll see it when they're pups, really. Um, The first thing that people notice is that they walk a bit funny and wobbly and they can be really weak on the back legs. So um, it can seem really dramatic when they're younger. And it's important to remember that it does settle a lot as they get bigger. 
um, and as they get older. So don't panic too much. You know, but when people have young dogs first diagnosed with, they start to panic and start to Google, you know, about hip replacement surgery and all this kind of thing. But it's very, very rare that they need to go forward to have hip replacement surgery. They want to be really, really bad cases. So don't panic too much. Um, what I would suggest is while they're young is to get them on controlled exercise. So lots of lead walking, that, that's going to keep them strong going forward. Um, and there's lots of kind of other exercises that you can do that can target certain muscles that will strengthen them as well going forward. So the stronger you can get them, the better as they go into kind of adulthood. So like I will be suggesting for dogs diagnosed with hip dysplasia to definitely have a physiotherapy consult and get a prescribed home exercise program. Um, even if it's one consult that you have, at least you have these exercises to do um, and to get them strong as they're getting older, really. That's like- and I'm going to move on down now. I'm just going up the uh, questions here for, let me see where uh, these questions. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah, perfect. That, let's see if that's shown up there. Uh, here we go. Perfect. Okay, so we have a few questions that have come in here. Uh, first of all, actually, Zoe here has sent in a few questions. Uh, my four year old rescue Greyhound Robert has an old muscle injury in his right hand leg it doesn't cause him any pain but in the winter it seems to stiffen up uh this is a two-part question by the lover we make sure to do warm-ups before walks and the like feed a whole food diet uh rich in glucosamine and make sure to avoid heavy wear on that leg 99 percent of the time it doesn't bother him and we have spent the last two years building up the stamina uh and muscle tone for hiking any advice on keeping that leg good okay um it's kind of hard to know without knowing exactly which muscle is involved and the degree of injury um that occurred but i suppose um it's it's important to kind of remember that uh, she says here that 99 percent of the time that he's okay so that's good that that would tell me that maybe the injury wasn't too severe and that he's made a good recovery as well so that is definitely good um but going forward she's she's right to kind of be mindful of it and um he packs and stretches to the effect of muscle um, are important, especially in winter, as she says, when he starts to stiffen up. So without knowing which muscle is involved, it's hard to know what, what stretches to do. Um, so that's where a physio consult would, would be important for this dog as well. And do an assessment of all the muscles really in that leg, and just make sure that everything's OK. Um, but once you kind of know which muscle um, is involved, then the stretches will really, really help in the winter, I think. Um, also, you want to kind of get an assessment to check, is that muscle strong enough? So just in case, like that dog could be avoiding using it and like she says 99% of the time he's fine but dogs like I said earlier are really really good cheaters so he could look like he's walking perfectly and have no issues but he could be very slightly offloading that side and then even though it's a really slight kind of alteration that he makes he can weaken very dramatically in that muscle as a result so um, you want to check that that muscle is nice and strong and then I suppose prescribed exercises can be given to help target that particular muscle or or that muscle group and strengthen on it going forward, get him engaging and get him loading properly, um, you know, so that he he doesn't have any issues going forward with weakening. So I suppose it's it's special for him. Oh, thanks for that, Karen. Okay, so let's move on here, bring back up the screen. And uh, this is another one from Zoe. Zoe loves sending in her questions each week to us. Uh, my foster greyhound is recovering well from a spay, but seems to be having trouble squatting to pee. Thought this might be from stiffness from the surgery, but it's been two weeks now. The incision is healed up, and she's still having issues, mainly standing up before she finishes urinating. Beth said to give it time, but she feels uncomfortable when she finishes her business. Do you think it's a sign of spay in- incontinence or a muscle joint issue? Um... I think two weeks after surgery is probably too early to be thinking about urinary incontinence. So I wouldn't worry about that just yet. Um, An important thing to note is that squatting and toileting is a huge functional and a really important functional movement for dogs. Um, And there's a lot of different muscles involved in performing this movement. And this is why as dogs get older, they struggle with toileting um, because the squatting involves, you know, a a really strong core um, and good core stability to be able to perform the movement. So um, I don't know if if you've ever had any abdominal surgery yourself, but um, it is quite a lot for the dogs to undergo. So even though the wound itself might have healed, there's layers of sutures underneath that again, and it would have gone through muscle layers as well um, that will 
will take longer to heal. And definitely my hunch anyway is that as as that dog is squatting, she's using and stretching all of those muscles still. So it still would probably be quite uncomfortable for her to do that. Um, so my hunch is that it's still a result of the surgery um, and that it, it will take another few weeks for her to be, you know, feeling normal again. Um, but it is important to keep an eye on her and you should expect to see an improvement each week. So each week she should get a little bit better and should, you know, not notice it as much. Um, if you're not getting that, then I would definitely go back and, and talk to your vet. Or if you really are concerned that there's a urinary issue going on, then maybe get a urine sample looked at as well in case there's a UTI or anything like that. But m- my hunch tells me that it's a functional thing and that she's just still feeling, you know, that wound from the surgery. Okay, Karen. And thank you, Zoe, for sending those questions there. Uh, so he's a huge fan of the show and was actually on himself uh, a couple of months back. Her, uh, Greyhound Robert was the runner up in the nose of Chile this year. So uh, that's pretty big thing for a dog owner, he says. All right, so let's move on. Uh, there's no name on the next few here. Uh, my dog is old and has hip arthritis. How much should I walk him? He loves going for a walk. Okay, but the first thing is that it's good that he loves going for a walk. So that's a really great sign. That's one of the first things that I look for, really. Um, so the fact that he loves going for a walk tells me that he's, you know, quite comfortable in himself. So that's great. Um, it's hard to know without knowing how active and and how able your dog is. So um, you need to kind of, it's, it's case by case. But the general rule that I have for older dogs walking is that um, little and often is key. So you want them to walk enough that they're engaging the muscles and um, they're using their joints, but that they're not overdoing it and causing pain either. So if they have osteoarthritis, you want to kind of walk them to a point where they're not going to be stiff later or they're not going to feel it that evening or the next day. Um, if you're getting to that point where they're stiff after it, you've done too much. So that's one way of judging it. Um, it's important as well when you're walking them to go at quite a controlled, continuous pace. So um, I always recommend going slow enough that they place their feet correctly and they're engaging their muscles more correctly that way. So that's more strengthening for them. If they go fast and they're trotting along and bouncing along, they're not actually engaging their muscles as well as they do when they're going slow. Um, so keep the pace nice and control- controlled and slow. Um, for old dogs, it is important to let them have their time as well of sniffing and having a wander and a potter. Um, I had a client before that called you know their dog going out for a sniff reading the paper um for dogs so it's really important that they get that time as well for their brain to go out and sniff and see who's been where and who's doing what um but do make sure that you integrate then the con- continuous kind of controlled pace of walking as well um Apart from that, um, I would also just recommend doing heat packs maybe in the evenings for an older dog after walks. If they're happy to have that sitting on the couch or whatever, um, heat is great to stop stiffness developing. Um, but I mean, the walking, it's great that he he is happy to do it because it's good. It, it keeps their joints moving, keeps their muscles engaged, keeps them strong and keeps them active and strong. So um, like I would recommend doing two to three short walks a day rather than one big long one um, and see how that works out for them. But if it, as I say, if it's causing stiffness or pain, then reduce it back, you know, find the balance. It, it's important to find the balance. A lot of people will say, oh, yeah, he, we go for a walk every day, but he's very sore the next day or he's very sore that evening. And they don't realize that it's the walk that has caused that, you know, so it's too much. If they get if they get that result, then it's too much for them. They need to cut it back. OK, okay. very good. Very good. Have OK, so let's move on to the next one here. And. Uh, what is the okay? We answered that actually already, so we'll skip that question. Uh, what is the average number of session a dog needs? Um, it depends really on the dog and the case, so it's very case specific. But I suppose for new cases initially, it can be quite intense. So depending on what's going on, I would usually recommend seeing them sometimes weekly, sometimes fortnightly for a little while um, until we start to get good results. And then as we start to get the results, I tend to spread out the sessions a little bit longer. So I'll start to see them monthly, you know, every six weeks. I have some dogs coming to me um, who've been coming to me long term, you know, with osteoarthritis or whatever. And I'll see them maybe even every eight weeks and they just come in and touch base with me and we do an assessment to make sure that everything's OK. Um, and we change things up a little bit depending on what we find. Um, so really, it depends. It depends on what we're treating. Um, but the general rule will be that it'll be quite intense to begin with. And then, you know, becomes less and less uh, as we go on. 
Okay, great, Karen. And we're going to take one more because I'm looking here at the last question uh, regarding the dog's behaviour. Uh, that would be more something that we could ask, I think, uh, to Samantha Rawson when we have her back on again. And Samantha was the behaviourist we had on last week. So I think you'd agree that's more a behaviour type question there, uh-huh. bottom one there. So the last question I'll put to you here, are physiotherapy costs generally covered by pet insurance? Yeah, usually they'd be covered. I think um, what the insurance companies look for is that the vet has recommended the physiotherapy and referred on for physiotherapy. So that is another reason why a referral is important. Um, every insurance company is different. So just check in with your own insurance company to be sure. Some of them will cover a certain amount of sessions and some will cover more, some will cover less. Um, and you can get pre-authorization if you want to before you come for your session and make sure that they will cover it. But generally, um, as long as your vet has recommended it, then most will cover it. That's brilliant. Okay, so that's the end of the Q&A. Uh, Karen, thanks for taking all those questions. Great. That was really good. And now we're going to move on because we have a product that we want to talk about, and we're bringing in the actual uh, owner of that company here, uh, Kieran Sheehan. Kieran, uh, we've had you on before, but welcome back to the Big Bark. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, it's great to be back on the Big Bark. Uh, Karen, uh, a mine of information there. I've learned an awful lot about how to treat dogs, so... That's, that's fantastic. That's Fine. good. So, Kieran, uh, your new website went live only uh, there a few weeks, a uh, couple of months ago. Um, how has Muckmuts been going? Actually, first of all, tell us, what is a Muckmut? Kieran, you have to mute yourself again. Can't beat this new technology. Um, <laughs> uh, you. Yeah, yeah, I don't think you could be heady technology, to be honest. But sure. <laughs> uh, just you can't beat it. You can't beat just telling people what 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 the the, the issue is, rather than uh, the fancy uh, phones. I apologise. I'm on a phone today because uh, my computer, um, just when you wanted to work, uh, didn't. So That's anyway, right. a mutmit bag. A mutmit is a bag that you use to pick up dog falling. So it's very simple. It's like. Uh, Mutt, uh, you know, when you get the name, Mutt for, is a kind of a trendy name for a dog. And then Mitt is like a bag, you know, like a glove. So they're like dog gloves. So there you go. You put your hand into it, um, wrap your hand around uh, the issue at hand, and then wrap the bag down over it and put it into a bin. So it's very that, simple. That, that's- Sounds pretty simple. I don't have any next to me here. They're actually out in the car. Oh, wait, I actually do. Hold on. I knew I brought one in. So this is actually what they look like. Um, right. That's the ones. And, like, I tried to do a video on this uh, a while ago, but um, my dogs are a bit camera shy, so that wasn't going to really happen. Uh, <laughs> but, like, literally what Kieran was saying, you uh, put it your hand in, just scoop down, and you just turn it inside out like that. Oh, that's actually and really yeah. It can be used as a, I often use it if I forget to bring the dog's bowl with me. The bottom bar can actually be formed into a water bowl as well. Oh, cool. Yeah, it, it, that's that's true. It's it's very handy in both ways. Like if you see at the bottom of it again there, Dara, you see a double layer, a double layer of black at the bottom at the very end. So so when, yeah. especially um, our, our, our female um, dog walkers, um, they might be a little bit squeamish or you know, guys or the same. Um, they don't feel the heat from uh, your, your dog's deposit and they oh. don't feel the squeamish of it. So the double layer is a real benefit. And then as you have it there, if you're out on a very warm day and, you, you know, obviously if you go for a long walk, you might the bottle that you bring might last you. So you can get water from anybody uh, walking by or in a house. You put the bag on, on the ground just use the black part of it and then put water into it and the dog will drink out of that. And, um, you know, it's, it's handy in that sense. And, you know, obviously, you know, Bruno has Bruno's oh. main appearance. Oh, come on. Hi, Bruno. <laughs> Is he going to do a demo? <laughs> um, I, no, maybe maybe not in Dara's house, but uh, maybe <laughs> not there. <laughs> <laughs> but as you can see, yeah. Bruno's a big dog now and... Um, uh, the bags are, are, you know, they're, they're a good size and, you know, it covers a lot of your up to your elbow. So you can pick up quite a, like a, it's not just for the little chihuahuas, it's for the, the big um, Dobermans and, you know, it covers all. So it's, 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 and you can walk with it then to a bin, you know, you don't have to throw it into a tree and um, 
walk down the road and put it into a bin and it's good. Well, to be honest, we I don't think we'd ever really encourage people to throw into a tree or into a ditch. Oh, but no, but you Kieran, just, they, see them in trees. <laughs> yeah. too, but Kieran, they're fully biodegradable, am I right? Yes, indeed, yeah. The, once they go to landfill, the thing about being biodegradable is that they have to go to landfill, um, a lot of these. So what happens is that in the landfill, all landfills create a certain amount of heat. So over time, the due to the heat, the bag will degrade. And, um, you know, in 5,000 years' time, uh, they won't be still stuck in the landfill and people worrying what was so special about dog fouling that people had these plastic bags on them. The other thing oh. that... Uh, the other thing a lot of people tend to use, um, they use compost bags to collect uh, dog fouling. And then they put it into their compost. But that's not the best idea in the world because uh, there's a lot of poisons in, in dog fouling. So if you're wondering why your cabbage is ungrowing, it's because you've poisoned your, your compost and then you're, you've now killed your cabbages. And so it's, it, people think that, oh, yeah, we'll just put it into the compost. You know, it's it's a myth out there that you can compost it. Yeah, I'm guilty of that one. <laughs> well, you're not get, you won't be guilty again. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have yeah, to get some money. I, 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 I don't actually know what Bruno's doing. I'm sure we can arrange here. that for you, Karen. <laughs> I, I don't know what Bruno's doing here. I think he's out to find you some treats and he's trying to root them out. So he's not he's not he's, he's not giving a demonstration of how what. <laughs> what <laughs> no, God, thankfully he's us. So, Karen, you've been going now for quite a uh, good few years. I don't, I don't mean age-wise. Well, that, that that kind of applies too. Like, but yeah. uh, it's always for the better with something, Karen. That so, Karen, you supply as well to a lot of the um, councils around Ireland. And what that's a, a presently supplies to practically all the councils in the country. There's a few are still a bit shy, but we'll, we'll wear them down. Um, the, most counts, county councils, a lot of town councils, which some kind of operate a little bit separate. There's a few municipal authorities still out there. Uh, we provide them to tidy town groups. A couple of businesses provide them in their, in their towns. Um, down in Bantry, there's a company called Roa Pharmaceuticals. They actually, believe it or not, um, own property, which has an airstrip on it, which people walk and they, they, you know, they do the walks around there. So they have supplied mutmets for people to enjoy while they're walking on their property. So, you know, there's companies like that. There's, we provide them, people buy them online. Since uh, the new website went live, we've had a lot of interest in packs of, like we have 200s in a, in a box that we, people will buy off us. So that's, that's really taken off since we started the website. Uh, but about two months ago, yeah. So it's 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 really helped business. Brilliant, brilliant. And I suppose, like I've asked you this before, I think. But where do you see the growth going? Where we would see growth is uh, maybe veterinary offices, um, more uh, towns around the country. You know, the, the not so much the very small towns, but the bigger towns. We'll say like like. Big towns, small cities like Limerick City itself, places like that. Um, you know, up along the Wild Atlantic Way, you know, where there's a lot of tourism places, you know, places like Bunratty Castle, you know, those and people were places where people can bring their dogs um, and walk them. Like, obviously, you'd have a, a Bob in Dublin and a lot of parks up there, out in Malahide Castle, you know, those big, huge places that people bring their dogs, go for walks, you know, forest walks, because you, you, you can't just let your dog go into a field and let them uh, poop in the field because that over time um, will leach into the water table and can travel, you know, into water uh, storage areas. So yeah. because of the, the um, toxic, toxicity of dog fouling, it's, like a lot of farmers feel, oh, we just send Shep up the field, that'll be grand. But that could, their dog fouling, even though it's only one or two out in a 50-acre patch, that could leach into the water table and as a result, um, you know, I suppose foul up the, the water system then. So it's you need to pick it up no matter where you are. So we'd see business 
we, we would be targeting business this coming year, uh, veterinary offices, um, even even doctors, surgeries. You know, people could, when they're in there, they say, oh, yeah, we'll, get, we'll take a few of these with us. Um, other places, uh, shops, you know, we get town councils to put. We have we have stands now you can put into onto shop counters. So we would be hoping that town councils would start putting them into shops so that people walk along the street, they'd see a sign, you know, complimentary dog falling bags available here. They might go in, pick a few bags, and then they might do bit of, they might buy a paper in the shop. So you know, it would be win win for everybody involved. So yeah, there's there's huge potential down the road. So. We'll, we, we've grown every year since we started 2012, so we'll hope we'll, we'll keep growing in 2021 and beyond. Fantastic, Kieran. Um, okay, so we're going to move on now to the next part of our show, Kieran. Thanks very much for telling us all about uh, Muppets. So I have an, an I do have an announcement in relation to the uh, our big show that's coming up on the 29th of November. Uh, we have officially this week come up with the name for it, and it is called All I Woof for Christmas. <laughs> so, the idea, as I explained last week, is we're going to have a variety of different businesses on. So far, we have 20 in total signed up. It's essentially the toy show for dog owners. This is all to raise funds for four annual welfare charities across Ireland. And we are actually going to tell you now the first two uh, charities that we have. And the first of these signed up is Limerick Animal Welfare. So we confirmed Limerick Animal Welfare there a couple of days ago. And the second one, let me just find where that show is. Here we go. The second one is the National Search and Rescue Dog Association in Ireland. So those are the two of the first charities that are signed up for this. All funds are raised on the 29th and our follow-up event, which I'll talk about doing on a sec, on the 13th of December, uh, all funds that will be raised will be going to uh, four different charities across Ireland. So we're delighted to announce uh, Lim Cannon Welfare, who we've done so much with in the past, and that we have uh, Sardar as well on board, and we'll announce the other two, hopefully by next weekend, or maybe next weekend live on the show. On the 13th of December then, we have our Santa Paws uh, sessions. So Santa himself will actually be on the show and he'll be reading out letters from uh, dog owners. And we also have uh, Santa sessions, uh, virtual sessions that are launching, the tickets for that are launching this Tuesday coming. Uh, all four seats again go to the four different charities. And the tickets for that will be eight euro for one dog. Uh, I think we have Kieran in twice here somehow now. I, I don't know. We don't really have any camera from him there. But um, somehow, I don't know what Kieran's playing. This technology doesn't it's work a, in a minute. Can you hear me there? I, it's, I, it's, I can it's, hear you. It's a bit like New York. I'm so good in him in twice. It's a bit like myself. I think I'm in two or three pictures here. So, I, I, I think you are, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, can't can't see yourself at all, but sure. Look, nobody. Really as you can see, I'm quite, as you can see, I'm quite a genius with technology. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll go with that. Well, on the thirteenth, as on the thirteenth, as I was saying, uh, virtual sessions uh, for dog owners with Santa. Uh, it's eight euro for one dog, or it is twelve euro for two or more dogs. We will also have a raffle on both days, where all proceeds again from the raffle go into the four charities. And we have on the 29th, on the 13th, and on our final show for the year on the 20th of December, we have a variety of live musicians lined up as well. So all that to come, it's going to be like, basically, like I said, the toy show for dog owners. So that's going to be pretty cool uh, things to come. Um, pretty sure that's, that's it for today. Uh, yeah, that's all that we actually have time for. So, Karen, thanks again. For joining us on the show, thanks for doing the Q&A session. That was, yeah. as Kieran said, a load of great information there. Uh, Kieran, are you, are you still there? I can still hear you, you know. Good <laughs> stuff, good stuff, Kieran. I'm somewhere thanks in the clouds, apparently. <laughs> 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 I 
you, you, but I can you, still hear you. And thanks a million, Dara. Always a pleasure. That's great, Kevin. And thanks to everyone for talking to us today about moments. So that's all for today. Uh, thanks for listening. And join us again next week. We'll be switching gears a little bit, and we'll be talking about dealing with grief after losing a pet. That's a bit of a sad one, to be honest. But it's something that I suppose over the past six months with COVID, with lockdown, we've all started to realise like how great dogs are for your mental health and the impact on losing a dog from your life is very hard um so we'll be talking about that with our co-host next week marcus from next life arms who will be joining us to share his own experience and tell us about the product that he has designed which is a fitting memorial for your pet so make sure you subscribe to the podcast on itunes or spotify so you never miss an episode and we're also on Patreon now as well. So if you enjoy this episode, head on over to support us by becoming a patron of the show. And 20% of your fee will go to our Animal Welfare Fund, which we will officially be announcing next week. It's a new fund that we're setting up. And each month uh, one in 2021, one charity will benefit. And we'll switch charities then uh, on a monthly basis. So... We're going to continue the fundraising as we go into the new year. And be sure to check us out on social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you'll find us on the Big Bar Podcast on all three there. And from all of us here, have a safe and a back and mad week. And we will chat to you again next weekend. The Big Bar, listen up, dog owners. It's for you. You canine lovers It's your favorite podcast The Big Bark With your host Dara Burke And canine co-host Bruno And Millie The Big Bark